Cocos Island, it's one of the few places in the world that is still pristine. It's already protected, but we need to do more. We need to connect this ecosystem with other ecosystems. Through the years, by doing research, we are finding that this is not only a very beautiful place, but a very important place. Hammerhead sharks, green sea turtles, oceanic mantas, all these endangered marine species use this corridor between oceanic islands in the Eastern Pacific as a main route for their migrations. Sadly, we have been discovering that the actual protection around Cocos Island is not as effective as we thought, as we can see fleets of fishers just waiting outside the protected area and still fishing all the sharks that come to the island. The overarching goal behind our research is to understand how these oceanic marine protected areas are really functioning for the conservation of these highly migratory endangered species. My home base is Galapagos, but I'm here to download a series of receivers that we've placed underwater with the partner organization. Those receivers will detect animals that have been tagged. We will go down like so. The bottom here is 90 feet, and the receiver, it's right here. So we've got to go down, pick up the receiver, uh, yeah, and then download the data and see, see who's been here. <laughs> The research that we've done shows that while it is true that these oceanic MPAs are absolutely necessary for the conservation of hammerhead sharks, turtles, on their own they're not enough. And the thing is, Cocos is just the only bit of this long mountain ridge that's underwater. Cocos is the only bit that sticks above it, so there's a physical mountain chain and they migrate along it between two marine reserves. Both are detecting declines in their shark populations. And it's not because of illegal fishing inside the reserves, it's because the sharks don't realize it's, there's a boundary. And so they leave to go to Galapagos and then they're fair game once, once they leave. Mostly it's hammerheads that move between the two. We've had the odd silky shark, the odd whale shark, the odd turtle. I'm just looking through the data here. No way. Someone's on it. We got a tiger shark that we tagged in Galapagos seven years ago. She's now here. That is the first record of that. That's another species to that connectivity list. That's a tiger shark from Galapagos. Oh, all right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting excited here. This is the first top predator, so this is a big deal. <laughs> In the case of Galapagos and Cocos, all the ocean between the two belongs either to Ecuador or to Costa Rica, and therefore it is not too far-fetched to imagine a scenario whereby both countries create a transboundary swimway, if you like, to protect these animals as they migrate so that they don't get picked off by long lines and persainers on their way to and from Galapagos. That won't just help the species along that route, that will help the populations build resilience to other impacts that we cannot control, such as climate change and the effects of international high seas fishing effort elsewhere. It is really important as we move towards this goal of protecting 30 by 30 that we're surgical with our interventions and that means using the best available data to guide us as to where that protection needs to occur. One thing we've learned with these tagging projects is that sharks are not dispersed randomly throughout the ocean, but they move from one aggregation site or hotspot to another following very specific migratory routes. An efficient conservation policy is going to include strict protection at the seamounts and at the aggregation sites, and also strict protection along their migratory corridors. We should look at marine protected areas from a whole different perspective than we look at protected areas inland. 
and we should start thinking on making international programs, international protected areas, and looking at critical corridors or hotspots between these islands that need to be completely protected from fishing. That will be the only way that we can ensure the survival of these species. People here in the islands, they ask them for it. They, they understand that they need it because this is an opportunity to get a better protection of what is the basis of their life. And when I talk about life, it's the basis of their food security, it's the basis of their economy. All the activities are linked with a marine reserve. Protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030 is really the minimum that we can do for our future. We know because we have science to give us the roadmap on where to protect. What are the places we need to protect first? To get something six and a half, seven years later in a different archipelago that's yet again showing the connectivity, this, this, this is just gold, this is gold. This is where 30 by 30 begins.